Be it movies, comedy, or television, he has always made an impression. He won critical praise for his work in such films as Bull Durham, Batman, and Good Morning Vietnam. As a comedian, he has starred in his own HBO Comedy Hour and toured the globe. And fans will always recognize him from his star turn as the title character in the hit series Arliss. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up next on Interviews, our conversation with actor, writer, director, comedian, and all-around great guy, Robert Wall. What about this business speaks to you? What was it that pulled you in and said, this is what I want to do with my life? Well, a couple of things I imagine. When you're young, one is attention. I think that's, you know, it's a way of getting attention. You know, people see you on a big screen, little screen, mass media, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's number one. Number two is it's a way of expressing yourself to more than one person. Um, you know, you could express your humor, your talent, your ideas, your point of view, and it gets across to a bunch of people. Entertaining is a lot of fun. I do like, you know, entertaining people. Um, you know, it's a way to make people feel good. It's a way to get, you know, but, but attention, I guess, it, I would say the first thing is probably attention. Is it easier for you to be liked, uh, admired, accepted by the mass out there you don't know as opposed to an individual single person? Is that harder for you? Good question. Um, I would say no, because if I, if I have an individual person, I could talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, I don't know how I'm going to be perceived on a mass level. Do you know how, unless, unless you're controlling the product totally. Right. And even then you don't know how it's going to be perceived. But one-on-one, -on -one, you can talk to somebody and get to know them a little bit, ask them questions. I, I can't ask questions of all the other people out there. You know, one-on-one, -on -one, I can find out something about the person I'm talking to. Yeah. Uh, how I'm perceived by masses out there is not really, that's a product you're putting out. I mean, they can perceive you as a character that you portray. They can perceive you from some sound bite that someone's taken out of context. Uh, so I would say probably one-to-one, -one, but it's, it's an interesting point. Yeah. Take me back to how all of this began, too. As I understand it, you began as a stand-up because you wanted to create that act. You, weren't, you didn't know how to sell yourself to those casting directors, so by doing the comedy, people got to know who you were. Yes. Um, I couldn't get a job. I mean, I could never get cast. I never got cast anything. A couple of parts in school plays, uh, but uh, no one was going to cast me, especially for parts that I wanted to do, you know, for parts that I wanted or for a style that I wanted to, to express my personal point of view. So you can do that with stand-up comedy. By doing humor and storytelling and telling jokes, you reveal something about yourself and who you are and a little bit of range and subtleties and whatever. So I use that as a stepping stone using people like Woody Allen as a role model, Mike Nichols, uh, Mel Brooks, you know, those people at stand-up comics who went on to be filmmakers, which is what I wanted to do, tell stories. Had you stayed just in comedy, would you have been happy? If you had just stayed a stand-up, could that have been your whole career? Could that have been the feast for you? No, I wouldn't have been happy. Really? No, no. So you always knew it had to be more. Yeah, because I would never... I enjoy it, and I still enjoy it, you know, entertaining and making people laugh. But the life of a stand-up comic is not for me. I, it's not what I wanted to aspire to. I love stand-up comics. I'd rather see a stand-up comic than anything in the world. But it's not what I want to do eventually. It, it's... it's, it's I, it was too limiting for me a little bit. I, I wanted to be on... A, I like working with actors. I like working in the editing room. Yeah. I like all the other stuff. I like creating the story. I like putting the stuff on the page. Do you know? So no, stand-up comedy was a means to an end. Not that I didn't enjoy it. Not that I if, didn't find it a great art form. But it's more of it was it was it was, a, it was it was a tool. What do you think it was though that makes, or what do you think it is? I should say that makes comedy click. What is it that you've learned out of all the years that you've worked in it? Timing. Is it all timing? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um. Well, when you say comedy, that's a, that's a broad term. Are we talking about stand-up comedy? Are we talking about comedy on film? Are we talking about comedy as far as drama? See, I don't look at theatrical or, or, or story, or, or I look at it all as drama. That's something I learned here. Um, under the mass, of, under drama, you have two mass of tragedy and comedy, but it's still drama. Mm -hmm. It's still conflict. And, how, and what situations and how people react determine if it's a tragedy or a comedy or if it falls somewhere in the middle, which is another thing I really enjoy is mixing the two. 
Um, Stand-up comedy is a totally different, that's a totally different art form. So the term comedy is really misleading because some people, because somebody doesn't laugh at a joke as a stand-up comic, well, your comedy might not be commercially funny. But there are other types of comedy when you're dealing with a, a more of a mass market. You have black comedy, you have satire, you have burlesque, you have gross-out comedy. You, I mean, so, so it's so wide. You have a situation comedy. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's so broad. So I, I don't know what that means. I mean, it depends on the style and the genre you're working in. Okay, let me, let me go a different way okay. then and say Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah. You worked with him. Yeah. What made him click? Why, was he, why is he a name we all still know? Rodney's probably the most underrated comic, comic genius I ever met. Rodney is a, was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant comic writer. Um, Rodney had these one-liners. That's why I started. And one-liner is very pure form because it is a, a good one-liner has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has a setup, and a, you, you have expository, setup, and a payoff. And it's very crisp, concise stuff. Um, and and it's, a, it's a great art form. It's a tremendous art form. And he also created the character that worked for him to deliver those lines. Now, somebody else could deliver those same jokes, although Rodney jokes are pretty universal. But, um, but he was playing the loser, which is a good staple. It's, it's hard to play a, a successful guy doing comedy. Losers tend to wear better, but that's why Cary Grant is just so brilliant. Um, but with Rodney, you had a great, great comedy writer. He had one of the, you know, as far as great comedy writers, you know, Larry Gelbart, Neil Simon, uh, Woody Allen, Rodney Dangerfield falls into that matter. I mean, for what he did, I mean, he's as good as anybody. So then how do you start off writing for someone like that? That must have been a trip. When I was in college here at U of H, the one comic we always just got around the table and watched was Rodney Dangerfield. He would go on The Tonight Show and really be funny. I mean, we always, I always thought he was, you know, we had George Carlin. The guys were George Carlin, Robert Klein, Albert Brooks, Rodney Dangerfield. Now, Rodney's much older than those other guys. But Rodney, there was something very hip about Rodney. Now, when I got to know him was when I first go to, he had a club called Dangerfields. And as soon as I get back there, I started knocking on his dressing room door and try to do jokes for him. And I, I would knock at the dressing room door, and there's Rodney who would be always naked in a robe. Rodney always, <laughs> you know, Rodney was many things genius-wise, but, you know, as far as a, um, a bon vivant, you know, <laughs> dresser was not one of them. Uh, and I'd say, I've got some jokes for him. And he'd go, okay, kid, let me hear him. And I'd say, okay, I'm all right now, but last week I was in rough shape. A guy comes up to me at the airport. He says, loan me $5 till payday. I say, when's payday? He says, I don't know. You got the job. So he'd say, okay, kid, the jokes are good, but don't do me. And so, I start, so it gave me a big leg up in the comedy clubs. I was just starting out that I was writing for Rodney Dangerfield, who at the time I start, Saturday Night Live has just begun. Mm-hmm. So it's about one year into Saturday Night Live, and it's, it's booming. I mean, the comedy explosion is about to happen. You have Saturday Night Live. You have Steve Martin. Dangerfield is taking off. The comedy explosion is, about, is happening. Uh, Robin Williams is about to happen. So I was in the right place at the right time a little bit. Yeah. So, and, uh, and I worked hard. Is it hard to see an established name doing your work and they're getting the credit? When you're sitting there and Roddy Dangerfield is doing your jokes and the people are laughing, is there a part of you saying, I want to be that guy? How do you? Depending on the joke and who you're doing it for. Now, for, uh, with Dangerfield, no, because you love writing for the character. You're, you see, I, I come from theater, so I'm writing for characters. So it's not as tough. I know what you're going at. Um, I mean, it depends who's seeing it. If nobody's seeing it, yeah, maybe. But like when you're writing for like the Oscars, when I was doing Billy Crystal's monologue with Billy, you knew that everybody was going to see your work the next day. I mean, everybody's going to see but your everyone's work. Everyone's going to think it's Billy Crystal's. Well, that's that's fine. That's fine. Really? I don't have a problem with that. That's fine. The people who know know. Yeah. I've always believed that. I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, the people who know know. You know. Yeah. Okay, so then you... And by the way, I'm getting a... And and contrary, I'm getting a lot of credit for Billy's genius. Right. Because nobody knows who wrote what. So what parts do you write? I I, I tell you, I have to look at the stuff and say, yeah, I think I remembered that one. And I got to tell you, if you ask three people, everybody's going to remember it differently. Yeah. How collaborative is it? Something like the Oscars, when you're sitting down to write those monologues, how much of it is anybody's joke, or is it just everyone comes together and it all develops as you go? When we did it, now I can only go by my own experiences. Right. You did it how many years? Three with Billy? Sounds about right. Three okay. or four years. Um, we did the Grammys first. We did the Grammys for like three or four years. Then we did the Oscars. 
When Billy and I first started doing it, it was just me and Billy and Billy's manager, David Steinberg. And that was for like the first three or four years. Then Bruce Valance joined us. So we were only, we were a very small group. When I saw Chris, Chris did it this year, Chris Rock, he had 14 writers. We were four guys. We were three or four guys. Wow. That was it. Um, so how, it was very collaborative, incredibly collaborative. One of the best collaborative experiences. You throw something out and, and, and you'd fight for it. Now, ultimately, Billy's got to deliver it, so Billy's got to be comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would always tend to push, you know, for a little something else. But Billy's got an edge. You know, people have accused Billy of not having Billy's got a great edge. I mean, he's got <laughs> one of the best one-man shows you'll ever see on Broadway right now. And um, Billy is, is really a great comic artist. I mean, I was very fortunate to work with him. So when do you make the move from doing the stand-up and working for Rodney Dangerfield and all that into television? I know at some point you'd even written a pilot. And I'm always curious, what was the series that you wrote? It never, uh, never went anywhere, No, right? no. Actually, it was, uh, I wrote a thing called History 101, and that was back in 1980. And uh, at the same time, I got a part in a movie. So I had acting, so, and I was doing and I did a little bit part in Flashdance. And then I got, uh, and I was always acting and doing club dates because I was performing. And, um, and then Good Morning Vietnam and Bull Durham and Batman happened in the 80s. But, uh, you know, so it's all part of the career. I don't, the, the television, I first started writing a television series, in, excuse me, in 19... 81, thing called Police Squad, right. Uh, I write with the Zucker Brothers. That goes off the air after five, six shows. I think we did six shows and that was it. And I did not work again ever in network television, ever. I've never worked in ever, since that point, actually. Uh, all my work's been on HBO. Yeah. And we do Arliss, and I wrote some other shows for him, but Arliss begins, I write the pilot, I think, at 92 was the first draft, 92, 93. And then we don't go on the air until 95. It took three years. What, t- what happens, for people who don't know, what happens in those three years? If you've written something that eventually is going to go on the air, there's got to be something good to it. Why does it take so long? Explain that. Well, first of all, you don't know what's going on there. You've written something that you think is good, and there are a thousand reasons, uh, mostly political. Uh, ultimately, it's about somebody's taste. It's ultimately about somebody. In, in our case, it took three years because the head of HBO at the time, uh, who was a big supporter of mine, a great friend, he felt that he was worried. HBO's first series, before anything else, was a show called First and Ten. First and Ten was based on a football team. It starred O.J. Simpson and Delta Burke, skinny Delta Burke, early on. <laughs> and it was basically a TNA show, a TNA show. That's pretty much what it was. It was night you could use HBO to do that. And it was kind of embarrassing to those who really knew sports. The head of HBO was a big sports maven. And he was afraid that Arliss was going to be, he didn't want it to be another first and ten, and at the time he was writing creatively really well with the Larry Sanders show, with Gary, and, and so he was afraid, he wanted to be sure it was more in that league than it was in the first and ten league. So he couldn't give me a green light on it. He gets fired, the guy who takes over says, I don't know anything about sport, but I think this is really funny. So he gives me the green light. So it has a lot to do with who's in charge, who's, who's making decisions. So all yeah. it is. Is it hard to do that show as long as you did and then have it just be done? First of all, it's very hard to do the show. Right. <laughs> very hard to do a show. Seven, seven seasons? Seven seasons, 80 episodes, and we're doing half-hour movies. Because each one had a beginning. It's not like a series where we have cliffhangers. That didn't happen. Each episode was self-contained, beginning, middle, and end. If you never saw the show before, it didn't make a difference. That was my choice. And that's very, very hard to do. Uh, it wasn't like story through lines and character arcs over a season. I never had that. Each show was an individual self-contained unit. Very hard. Uh, to stop it is hard because, in my case... We never lost any crew or any cast. We stayed together the same seven, for seven years, the same people. So you develop a camaraderie, the people you're working with. And I don't mean just the actors, which is wonderful. I mean the writing staff. I mean the people I go to the sound mix with, my editors with me for seven years, my uh, post-production people. I mean, it was just great. So you miss... In fact, I see, still see most of them today. I mean, we would keep in contact. But you do miss it that way. It was very hard. Very, very hard to do. I mean, it's just, it's just but no different than any other show, but that was very hard because I was rich. And the other thing that we're very proud of it was that we went up in the ratings for seven consecutive years. It was every year we went up. Very, very, very See, few that's shows the part do that. That surprises me about the story because if the gr- audience is growing, why does it end? Why did it happen? The reason it ended is that HBO, unlike a commercial network, is built on subscribers rather than, than commercial advertising time. So the, whereas the ratings matter, and they do matter, what's more important is the subscribers to the whole book. So their feeling was, 
let's try something else. Now, Arliss, for all the wonderful things that people wrote about us and everything else, we were never the uh, the she-she critics' favorite darling. We had a lot of great critics. New York Times, I mean, we had a lot of great people supporting us. But we weren't the guys who were the intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. We were more populist. That's why we kept having ratings every year. I'd have people like Fran Leibowitz come up to me, the great writer, and say, I hate sports and I love your show. <laughs> I'd have David Halberstam come up to me and say, your show is really on the money and you're saying some stuff. David Milch, who now does Deadwood, said, I don't know if you realize how you're pushing the envelope. And, uh, and so I had the, the huge supporters who loved the show, but we were not the, we always referred to stuff, we were the stepchild at HBO because they had The Sopranos and Sex in the City and Six Feet Under, which were all critics' darlings. Um... And we were, not, we were not that show. We just weren't. And a lot of it had to do, which I did not realize at the time, had a lot to do with because we had jocks on the show. And there's a lot of people who hate jocks and hate sports and won't give you the second choice. You know, there are people who may have reviewed a show because ours from the first year to the seventh year is a totally different show. It's, I mean, in the beginning, it's very broad. It's funny. It's big. It's fast. Some people really like it better. As the show goes on, it becomes much darker. I get into more serious issues. You know, we're getting into uh, abuse between athletes. We're getting into uh, stuff with breast cancer and Alzheimer's and, uh, and steroid abuse and everything years ago. So it became darker. And to some people, they liked it. To some people, they didn't like it. So, um, but like, the viewership kept going on. Again, getting back to, they felt that we're not going to lose, lose any subscribers if we don't go ahead and use our list because we, have our, we won't lose anybody. It's a choice. So let's try something new and try to broaden our base. Right, bring more folks in. Uh, yeah, and i got to tell you, it's seven years. Not many shows go seven years. Yeah, I'm, well, that's a great you run, know, but it's just like, funny and to out, hear. And go out higher. Go out at your top. Right. And I really felt that was really good because I had a thing where I did not want to go out, you know, like it was time to go. Yeah, you didn't want to be a show, oh, that thing's still on, kind of, you know. Well, a lot of people thought of that from the day one. Yeah. You know, but, but, <laughs> but, no, it was, it was all about my, it was all about my feeling that if we're going out, okay, now's a good time. Yeah. Now, there have been some films that you have been involved with that have been humongous successes. When you're working on them, because you haven't done, ultimately, that many films. No. Yet your name is in a whole lot of films that are these big milestones. Flashdance. Yeah, know, Flash Dance, I have but, one line. But people know that film. You're in that film. Batman. Bull Durham. Batman's a bold movie. Bull Durham was not a big movie when we are doing it. But it's, it's around. Oh, yeah. You know? It's I mean, a great movie. Things, no. How do you know? How do you pick what you do? I didn't. I was offered jobs. I didn't have that much choice. I mean, I, 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 I can't remember. I bet you I've turned down three things in my whole life. I don't turn, although, I'm pretty good at saying no, but I haven't been offered that much, to be honest with you. Uh, Bull Durham, I gave the worst audition in the history of mankind. Ron, Ron Shelton said, go ahead and hire him. Uh, there's something <laughs> there. Ron Shelton, I have a big part of my career. I owe to Ron Shelton. Barry Levinson and I had met for Diner, and we had met for a couple other projects beforehand. And uh, Good Morning Vietnam came up, and it was just a good fit for that. Bull Durham, nobody knew this was going to be a hit movie. But a baseball movie had never been successful. Right. So that, that came out of nowhere. Batman, you knew, was a big movie. Yeah. Batman, at the time, is the most expensive movie ever made. So the one thing I knew about Batman is it would be released. <laughs> so, you, know, you never know how it's going to go. Yeah. But I knew, being in London shooting the sets, Tim Burton and everything, I would tell people, this has Star Wars potential to be that big. And it's a good movie. First Batman, it's a pretty good movie. How's Tim Burton to work with? Great. Great. Is he crazy? Is he strange? No. What's going on there? No, he's an artist. He's a visionary. And he's, and he's just so encouraging. No, it's great. I've been very fortunate. I've worked with 99.9% .9 of people I've worked with has been really great. Really? Why do you think that is? It can't all be luck. You sit here and you say, you know, but you uh -huh. could have just listed a bunch of movies that were all flops or that nobody had ever heard oh, of. Oh, I got them too. But you very know. few. Eh, more than you think. Um... <laughs> And sometimes there's the movies I like, I like a lot. A movie like Mistress. I love Mistress. It was Barry Primus, and I was with De Niro and, 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 and Martin Landau, and I just love that movie. A movie Cobb that very few people saw, which is Ron Shelton's film with Tommy Lee Jones. I love Cobb. Um, but uh, uh, the people are great because they're collaborative. They're usually very smart people. And when they hire me, also, I guess they're on my wavelength or I'm on their way. But for whatever reason, there's a simpatico, and they want me to be creative, and they want me to come up with stuff... Uh, uh, you know, I've been really lucky. I mean, I think there is something to be said about luck and, and being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Do you learn things from these directors? Every one of them. Do Every you go there thinking, you know, I already knew that. I already knew that one. No, I try to learn from everybody. Yeah. I try to learn from everybody and to see what they're trying to do and how can I help them achieve it.
Is there something, if you had to give up all but one element of it all, would you say, I'm going to stay as directing or acting or writing or comedy as stand-up? We can't say comedy. Any? Comedy's different. Comedy okay. is, is, is not a... a, a oh, it would be directing. I would stay with directing because you, you, you involve so many hats. I, I mean, I love writing. I mean, I love... Writing, you can have, nobody can stop you ever from writing. They can stop you from directing because you have to have money. You have to do all that. Uh, writing, they can never stop you doing. Uh, I love directing because I get to work with actors. I get to work with post-production. I love post-production. I get to work with stories and editing. And, uh, and I, get to, I get to put everything together, all the pieces together, and make the story work. When you say you love to work with post-production, are you one of those folks that are never quite done? Are you oh, always no, 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 thinking no, tinkering, no. or do you know when done is oh, done? Oh, no, no. You gotta be, I mean, when you have to turn out a show each week, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're done. It's going on the air. <laughs> when you watch then Arliss back on DVD or whatever, and you see these episodes, are you still working on them a little bit in your head, or can you... Be done. Truth be told, I don't watch them. Really? I don't watch them. Why? I did them. Move on. Move on. I mean, like, once in a blue moon, I might, it might be on TV. I mean, I, I bet you I haven't seen five episodes since we went off the air. I, 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 don't, I don't watch them. Go to the next thing. I mean, if they come on, it's a great, and I'll remember other stuff rather than, you know, uh, I'll remember, boy, this, was, this episode was a pain in the ass. <laughs> this episode was hard to shoot. God, it was 110 that day. Uh, I remember how he cheated certain... You know, it, it's, I'll remember it from a different place, you know, or, uh, what was going on that day or, or how we put it together in the editing room and, uh, and what fights we had on the set. You know, so I, I'm coming from a different place. Yeah. So once they're done, they're done. You know, so I don't look at them because, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure I would, you know, second-guess myself. So what's the purpose? Yeah. Take me back then. Game shows. True or false? $10,000 pyramid. True. How'd you do? One. How much? Ten thousand. <laughs> Never. Um, wa- another point. I, I talk about my buddy Tim Arrington, who I, uh, I was living with here. Then, uh, how we would watch the twenty, the ten thousand dollar pyramid every day in the afternoon when I was going to school here. This is just when I get out of U of H, and I wanted to go on as a contestant. And I apply for a contestant. I get on, and I win, and I uh, and I win ten thousand dollars. And this is a show I watched every day and never missed since the day I was on the pyramid. I've never turned it on again. No reason to. I did it. Really. Yeah. Were there celebrities on the episode you were on? Do you oh, remember? yeah, Sandy Duncan. Sandy Duncan. Sandy Duncan <laughs> helped me win. I'm always, I'm always in, uh, indebted to Sandy Duncan. That gave me a, that, that was really nice. And we actually used a clip of it on Arliss one time. Right. We used a clip of me being on the pyramid on Arliss. Have you ever run into her since? I think once. I think would, you, once. would you mention it when oh, you Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, thank you. Thank you. Dick Clark was on the show, and I mentioned it to him. And I actually showed him the clip you know, of me funny. winning on the pyramid. Yeah. True or false, you were on the dating game. Absolutely true. Uh, when I first came out to L.A., what most people don't know, a dating game was an after gig. So a lot of actors would go on because they had to pay you scale. So that paid my rent for about three, four months. And they loved having comics who could improvise. If you look back, you'll see Andy Kaufman, Pee Wee Herman, uh, uh, um, uh, Tom Selleck, yeah. uh, myself. I mean, there was a lot of comics. Uh, Taylor Negron. We would go on because of um, it paid the rent. And they let you go. I mean, they just, I'd much rather do that than some stupid sitcom where I got to say it a main line. At least they let me put that. I would go on in bandages and like, like I was in a car accident. <laughs> I'd come on as a stoner, a hippie. Uh, I won once. I actually won once. I went on the date with the chaperone. He got laid. Not me. He got laid. <laughs> the, uh, true story. True story. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. No, absolutely. That was a paying gig. Hollywood Squares. Yeah. How do they prepare you for Hollywood Squares? question people have always wondered, do you know the questions? Yes, you know the questions. So they yeah. do tell you the questions ahead of time. No, they don't know. tell you. They, when you get there, they give you the list of the questions. They don't give you answers. Right. They give you questions, and which is smart because then you're prepared for it. You know, you know, they're doing a show. You've got to be entertaining. So if you give a guy a half an hour to think of an answer, he's going to come up with a better answer than if you give it to him on the fly. Now, you don't know the uh, secret square stuff. You know, all that stuff like that, that you don't know. I went on for a couple of reasons. One is uh, my friend Whoopi Goldberg who has always been great, and uh, we've worked together on Comic Relief for many years, and, you know, she asked me to do it, and absolutely. I'm, I am a very loyal guy. I, I, I think loyalty is one of the two or three most important traits that somebody can have. And so, uh, and I've always enjoyed it. You know, it's like I never had a problem. You know, it's like well, my buddies were on it, so we had a good time. Yeah. So what are you working on now? I just did a pilot now. I'm just doing a pilot now putting together uh, for HBO called Assume the Position with Mr. Wall, and it's actually, I am teaching real NYU students history. It is totally legit. It's real students, and I'm teaching real history, but making it fun and entertaining to, uh, to all the students. And we're having a blast with it. It's, it's unlike anything on TV, and it's really cool. So why did you decide to go that route? I'm a big history buff. 
and um, and I tell them stories about where things come from, origins of stuff, how history is pop culture and going back and stuff that we thought was true. And history, history if you look at the definition of history, nowhere in the world is the word truth mentioned. <laughs> you know, Tolstoy said, history is a wonderful thing if only it were true. Yeah. And, and as Napoleon said, history is a myth men agree to believe. So, so I'm into history and I'm trying to make students make it entertaining. Because if you tell them where stuff comes from, and they can understand how it pertains to them and how to, something happening today could actually turn into history. And years from now, it, it becomes very entertaining and very, a lot of fun. It was great fun to do. How much prep and work is it for you? It must we be did insane. it a couple of months. Yeah. It was a couple of months putting together the whole lecture. Yeah. How long is, is it? A, a one time or is it? Well, this a is a pilot. We just shot the pilot, so it's a pilot for a series. If it becomes a series, how much time is it going to take to do? Well, I'll have more of a writing staff too. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, this was me and two other people. You know, if it's a, if it's a show, you prepare more. You have yeah. more, longer, longer lead time. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit My down pleasure. and chat with us. A pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Robert Wall. Thank you. Order a transcript, call 866 652 3378 or send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.